Okay, so yesterday we talked about the anthophytes, the large plants that live in the ocean. Um, and today we get to talk about algae or seaweed that live in the ocean. So seaweed and anthophytes are similar in one way, or two ways basically. They both need light and nutrients. And that's basically where the similarities stop. Okay, So they both need light and nu nutrients because they are primary producers. But after that, everything else is just kind of different. So on your notes, um, this slide is where you fill in on the chart. Okay, so I've already got the part for anthophytes filled in for you, so you just need to fill in the algae part. Okay, so the differences between algae and anthophytes are many. One of the main ones is algae do not have root systems. They do not have root systems. They absorb nutrients directly from the water. Okay, so anthophytes have their roots stuck into the ground and then they absorb nutrients through their roots. That does not happen with algae. Okay? Algae absorb nutrients throughout their entire body. Um, also, all parts of an algae will do photosynthesis. Okay? Whereas in land plants, anthophytes, only the leaves do photosynthesis. But algae, the whole thing can do photosynthesis. Also, algae live in a denser fluid than our um, land plants do. Land plants live in air. So they're going to need more structural things to hold them upright, like stems and stuff like that. Whereas algae live in denser fluid, like water, and so they don't need the same support structures that land plants need. So they don't have like the big um, trunks of trees and stuff like that. Right? They also live in different sediment types. So algae live on hard surfaces attached to rocks, whereas anthophytes live in soft surfaces so that their roots can go into the ground to be able to soak up nutrients. Right? So they live in different sediment types. Okay. Parts of an algae. So this is one type of algae. Um, this is the sea palm. Okay, so you've got your blades up here at the top. Those are the big flattened parts. The stipe is this part right here, and then the hold fast is down at the bottom. And then some types of algae will also have another part which is called the nematocyst or air bladder. Okay. So you've got your blades up here at the top. This is your air bladder, this little bubble looking thing. Um, the stipe is the big long connector and then the hold fast is at the bottom. I would draw this in your notes or an example of an algae in your notes and label the different parts because you're gonna need to know those. Okay, so let's look at each of the parts of the algae and see what they're going to be doing. So the blade, that's the big flattened part at the top of the algae. Um, and the blade is where most of the photosynthesis is going to take place. Um, it looks like a leaf of the algae, but it's actually not technically a leaf. Um, leaves have some very specific structures in them that the blade of, a, of an algae does not have. Um, so it's not considered to be a leaf, but it, it does do most of the photosynthesis like a leaf would. It's also the place where most of the nutrients are absorbed. And so most of the nutrients get absorbed through the blade. That's different from a land plant, right? Most of the nutrients, all of the nutrients are absorbed through the roots. Depending on the type of algae, okay, you're going to have different like sizes of blades. Okay, so you can have like the big broad blades or small like skinny blades or even like teeny teeny tiny ones. Okay, just depending on the type of algae that you are looking at. Okay, so different species will have different sizes. The air bladder. Okay, the air bladder is like the floaty of the algae. Okay, so it functions to keep the blade up at the surface, okay, near the sun in the photic zone. So just like your mom or dad would put floaties on your arms, right? The little orange floaties when you were a kid to keep you up at the surface and not drown, that's what the air bladder does. Okay, it keeps the blades up at the surface. It's filled with gas. Gas is less dense than water, and so it floats and keeps the blades up at the surface. Depending on the type of algae, um, you will have n different numbers and sizes of air bladders. So if you can see here, right, um, each blade has a little air bladder attached to that. You see it? Okay. And then over on the right, you, there's one big air bladder. This is Elkhorn kelp. Um, and Elkhorn kelp only has one big air bladder that keeps all of the blades up at the top. 
Whereas in macro, so it's this giant kelp over here on the left, each blade has a blade, uh, air bladder. All right. Okay. The stipe is what looks like the stem of an algae. It's not actually a stem because a stem has structures to transport nutrients from the roots up to the leaves. Um, and the stipe does not transport anything. It is just simply a connector. It connects the hold fast to the blades. It's also very flexible so that when um, the waves come, that algae can just bend with the waves and the currents and um, not get broken off and transported somewhere else into the ocean. Right? So it's very flexible. And again, depending on the type of algae, the size or even presence of the stipe will vary. So you have certain kinds of algae that will have big, strong stipes okay, in order to attach them to a surface. Or like on the right, this is sea lettuce. It has no stipe. Okay, it's just simply a hold fast attached to a blade. Right? So this depends on the type of algae. And then the last one, that's the hold fast. Yeah, that's the anchor of the algae. So it attached to, attaches to a rock or some hard surface and anchors the algae in place. Um, it looks like a big root system, but it's not a root system. It simply functions to hold an algae in place. Um, how many of you have been to the beach and you've seen like the whole like big like um, pieces of algae washed up on shore like kelp? And then have you seen the ends where it looks like a big tangled root mass? Have you seen that? That's the hold fast. That's what it uses to hold on to the dirt. Okay, the hold fast, um, the size of the hold fast will vary depending on the amount of wave action that that algae lives in. So if it lives in a place where there's lots of strong waves, it'll have a bigger hold fast to hold onto the rock. And if it lives in a place where there's not a lot of wave action, it'll be small, right? Because it doesn't have to hold on as tight. Um, All right, algae life cycles are weird. Okay. They have a special kind of life cycle. Um, they have what's called an alternation of generations life cycle. So basically, it's two or more separate multicellular stages that can have different amounts of DNA. What does that mean? Well, they have two stages. Okay. The stages are called either the sporophyte or the gametophyte. Okay. Those are the two stages. Um, and they're multicellular, so they're made out of lots of cells. Okay. And they have different amounts of DNA. So one of those is haploid and one is diploid. Do you remember what that haploid and diploid means from freshman bio? Yeah, uh, yeah, one set and, or two sets of DNA. So haploid would mean that you have half of the amount of DNA. Diploid would mean that you have the full set of DNA. Okay. Well, so yes, your, um, your body cells are diploid. All right, so like if you took a skin cell, and you looked at the DNA from there, you'd have 46 chromosomes in there. But any sex cells that you produce, eggs or sperm, uh, those are haploid. So they have half of the amount of DNA. So that when you reproduce, right, you have half of the DNA in the egg, half of the DNA in the sperm, they come together, they give you the full set of DNA, okay? So you have the gametophyte, okay, which is haploid. It has half of the DNA. And then you have the sporophyte, which is diploid and has both sets of DNA. And we notate that with, like this. So you have, if it's dip, uh, haploid, we write it as 1N. It means it only has one set of DNA. Okay, diploid, we write that as 2N. It has two sets of DNA, both sets. Okay. Um, write this down, and then we're going to talk about your like two types of alternations of generations. And then we're going to show you pictures and explain it, and it'll, I think that'll help. Pictures. Okay, so you have two types of alternation of generations life cycle. You can have isomorphic or heteromorphic. Iso means same, morphic is features. So isomorphic alternation of generations, the sporophyte and the gametophyte have the same features. They look exactly the same. So if you were to look at an algae that has the alternation of or isomorphic alternation of generations. Um, you would not be able to tell just by looking at them whether it was haploid or diploid, whether it was the sporophyte or the gametophyte, okay, because they look the same. In heteromorphic, they look different. So 
you can tell just by looking at it whether it's the sporophyte or the gametophyte because the sporophyte and the gametophyte look different. All right? So, you ready for pictures? Okay, so this is an isomorphic alternation of generations life cycle. This is when the gametophyte and the sporophyte look the same. Okay, so how does this work? Well, you've got your gametes, your eggs and your sperm, okay, that come together and join and form a zygote. Okay, that zygote is diploid. It has the full set of DNA. So you take two sets and you put it together, you get the full set of DNA. Okay, so it's 2N. That zygote settles down and grows and becomes the sporophyte. Okay, the sporophyte has the full set of DNA. The sporophyte produces spores. So if you were to take a little piece of this sporophyte and zoom in on it, okay, you would see something that looks like this. Okay, each of these little green circles is a cell on that sporophyte. Okay, and each of these little cells produces spores, releases spores that have half of the DNA. They're haploid. Okay, so they release the spores into the water. The spores settle down um, and grow and become the gametophytes. All right, the gametophytes produce the gametes, but then fuse and join and form the sporophyte. Does that make sense? So you alternate back and forth, algae alternate back and forth between being a sporophyte uh, in the diploid stage and the uh, gametophyte in the haploid stage. Does that make sense? Okay, um, and easy way to remember it, sporophytes produce spores, gametophytes produce gametes. All right, so they alternate back and forth between um, different amounts of DNA. And this is an isomorphic because both the gametophyte and the sporophyte stage look exactly the same, right? Okay. Then heteromorphic is when the gametophyte and the sporophyte stages look different. So the sporophyte stage, that's the diploid stage, the full set of DNA, that's typically these happen in brown algae and big kelp. And so the sporophyte stage is this big giant thing that you see as Noah's kelp. Okay, the gametophyte stage is um, a little bit different. So the sporophytes produce the spores that settle down and become the gametophytes, okay? But the gametophytes are actually microscopic. So they're teeny, teeny, tiny, right? Whereas the sporophyte stage can be, you know, hundreds of feet long, so it's big. Um, so they settle down and become the gametophytes. And in um, heteromorphic alternation of generations, the gametophyte have sexes. So you have a male gametophyte and a female gametophyte. The female produces an egg, the male produces sperm, the sperm come and actually fertilize the egg, which remains attached to the female, um, and produces the zygote that then grows on top of the female gametophyte and crushes it and grows into the sporophyte. Does that make sense? So again, you alternate back and forth and it's heteromorphic because they look different. All right? Okay. So, this is to help you see the difference. So this would be like the gametophyte stage and the sporophyte stage. These are switched. You can see the difference between the two. All right, so we take algae and we can divide them into different phylums based on their pigments that they have. Okay, so just like we did for phytoplankton, we divided it into groups based on the types of accessory pigments that they have. We do the same thing for algae. Um, and just like for phytoplankton, the different accessory pigments help to reduce competition for light because, remember, different wavelengths of light penetrate to different depths in the ocean, and so it helps to allow for things to live deeper in the water and to survive and reduce the competition. Okay, and so here's your little reminder. So blue light penetrates the deepest into the water, and red light is the shallowest. And so if you have a, an accessory pigment that absorbs blue light, you can live deeper than if you have a red one. All right. Those pigments also play a role in determining what we call the compensation depth for an algae. So compensation depth is the depth at which the algae can live and maintain its size, but not get enough sunlight in order to grow. So for example, like you, eating enough calories in order to maintain your weight, okay? So you're eating just enough calories to maintain your actual weight. You're not losing weight, you're not gaining weight, okay? 
Um, but if you start eating more calories, okay, then more than you need, okay, and that means you'll start gaining weight, right, or like growing. So same kind of thing for the algae. Their compensation depth is the depth in the water that they can live and maintain their size, but they don't get enough sunlight in order to get enough energy to grow. All right? So it's called compensation depth. Um, three main groups of algae based on their pigments, chlorophyta, phaophyta, and rhodophyta. Chlorophyta, green algae, phaophyta, brown algae, rhodophyta is red algae. Okay, and so we're going to look at each of these. Here's some pictures to help you see. So upper right, that's uh, green algae. Okay, this right here, bottom right, that's brown algae. And then this right here, bottom left, that's red algae. All right. Okay, chlorophyta. We don't have too many species of green algae in the ocean. Okay, green algae is typically a freshwater species of algae or found on land. Um, so <coughs> we don't have too many species that live in the ocean, but two that are most common are sea lettuce and enteromorpha. Okay, enteromorpha is like a stringy looking algae that I'll show you a picture of. The pigments that, cl that chlorophyta have is chlorophyll, which is why they look green. Okay, so it, it helps you to remember, right, chlorophyll looks green, chlorophyta, green algae. Okay. These guys are primary producers, and so they have to respond to herbivores because they get eaten all the time um, and in order for them to survive and reproduce and not just all get eaten and for the species to die out they have to be able to respond to herbivores and um, they'll do that in several different ways one of the things that they will do is they will actually grow and reproduce very quickly so they grow faster than they can be eaten up okay so that they can um, survive or they'll also grow where herbivores can't reach. So some types of green algae can grow higher in the inner tidal, okay? So they'll grow up out of the water, and so the herbivores that are in the water can't make it up to them to eat them. Okay, so they'll grow where the algae or herbivores can't reach, or they'll make themselves taste bad. So they'll produce toxins, so when an herbivore like munches on them, they get a horrible taste in their mouth, and they like spit it out, and like, okay, I'm never eating that again, all right? So they'll taste bad. Um, by producing toxins or also by putting calcium carbonate into their cell walls. So calcium carbonate like chalk, right? So it would be like you taking a big bite of chalk. Okay? That would not taste good. Right? So um, they do that so that herbivores don't eat them. Make sense? Okay. Here's some different kinds of green algae. So upper right, that's sea lettuce. That's a green algae. This bottom right, that's enteromorpha. Okay. And then this top left, that's an algae that's called dead man's fingers. So it supposedly feels like a dead man's finger. I don't really know what dead man's fingers feel like, but like it's weird. That's what it's called. So that's top left one. So if you like feel it, it's supposed to feel like somebody's dead. It's a little morbid, you know. Rhodophyta, red algae. Okay. Um, you have several different kinds of red algae that live in the marine environment, but again, not there's more red algae that will be found in freshwater environments. Um, but Porphyra perforata is nori. That's the algae that you eat when you eat sushi. And that's the algae they put in sushi. Um, it is good. It's delicious. So that's one of the types of red algae that you'll find in the ocean. Um, you've also got coralline algae that will put calcium carbonate into their cell walls and some kinds of fuzzy reds, it's kind of like short, fuzzy looking algae. Okay. Their pigments, they have chlorophyll and phycobilins. Okay. So that phycobilin reflects red light and gives them their characteristic red color. Okay. And also chlorophyll to do photosynthesis as well. Um, their response to herbivores, they grow really fast as well. So they grow faster than they can be eaten to replace what they lose to herbivores. And what's cool is they can actually change their shape. So um, if they sense that an herbivore is like munching on them, they'll actually change their shape so that the herbivore can't eat them anymore. So if the herbivore has like a little mouth, it'll grow, the algae will grow thicker so that the herbivore can't get its mouth on it and eat it anymore. So it'll actually change the shape of the algae. So that's pretty cool. Then here's how we use rhodophyta because we actually use red algae in a lot of different things. Um, we eat it directly when we eat sushi, but we can also extract chemicals from it. 
uh, and use those chemicals in a lot of different things. So one of the chemicals that we can ex extract is called auger. Okay. How many of you freshman year, freshman bio, took like a swab somewhere on campus and then put it on an auger plate and grew bacteria? Okay, some of you did. Um, so that plate that you used to grow that bacteria, the gel that's at the bottom, that came from a seaweed when we extracted auger from it. Okay, and then used that to form that gel. So it only takes like, auger special because it only takes like a little bit to form a gel, which is kind of cool. So we use it in bacteria, growing bacteria a lot. If you're ever in microbiology doing anything with bacteria, you will grow tons of bacteria on plates all the time. Yeah, so we use it a lot. Um, have you guys ever heard of gel electrophoresis, maybe? Okay. Um, so basically what gel electrophoresis is, is, is how we separate out DNA strands and get like DNA profiles. So in crime scenes and stuff like that. So you have like a gel and you have little wells and you put the DNA section or, or DNA samples in there and then you run an electrical current across the gel and the DNA separates out and then that's, that's like the picture that you'll see, oh, this is my DNA profile, okay? That's what we use. And the gel that we use to do that process is, comes from auger, which comes from seaweeds. So kind of cool. So we use it for that. And it's also a thickening agent to help thicken things up. Another thing that we extract from algae is carrageenan. Carrageenan is found in tons and tons and tons of food products. It is a thickening and a binding agent. So it means that it thickens. If you were to take like something very liquidy and put a little bit of this in it, it would thicken it up, like make it into a pudding more consistency. Okay. Um, it's also a binding agent, which keeps things in solution, keeps it from separating out. So if you're actually to look at a lot of different food labels, you will see carrageenan in the ingredients. So, so like in your coffee creamers, morning star bacon, okay, toothpaste has carrageenan in it, gushers have so. carrageenan, yes, um, soy milk, silk soy milk has carrageenan in it to keep it from like separating out, ice cream has carrageenan in it, all of your like ready whip, that sort of stuff also has carrageenan in it. So if you look at the at the ingredients, you'll see, oh, carrage carrageenan is listed as one of the ingredients. Uh, this one has alginate in it, which is something else, which we'll talk about. But does that make sense? Okay, so chemicals we extract from algae that we use in food products and other ways. Examples, pictures of red algae. Okay. Okay, phaophyta, brown algae. <coughs> These are mostly marine species, mostly found in the ocean. And they're mostly kelps. So they're large algae and they're found in cooler waters. So they like temperate and subpolar regions. They're not really found in the tropics. Right? Two types that we have off of our coast, macrocystis and feather boa kelp. Okay? So giant kelp and feathered boa kelp. Um, typically, probably what you'll see washed up on the beach a lot of times will be macrocystis, but you'll also be able to find feathered boa kelp. Um, the pigments that they have, they have chlorophyll and then also a fucoxanthin, which is what gives it, the, it its yellow brown color. Okay, um, And then how they respond to herbivores, they have very thick cell walls, which makes them very like chewy and tough and hard to eat. So they make themselves hard to eat in the first place, and they grow really fast as well. All right. One of the things that we can extract from brown algae is alginate. Okay, alginate is the chemical we extract, and it's used in lots of different things. It's also a thickening and binding agent like carrageenan, but um, we use it in dentistry. How many of you have been to the dentist where they like put that stuff in your mouth and they're like, hold your mouth still and it like hardens up and takes a mold of your mouth? That's alginate that causes it to form that like hard stuff. And it's like disgusting and they try and make it taste like bubble gum, but it actually doesn't. And then it like, you're trying not to choke and like throw up while, it, yeah. It's disgusting. <laughs> All the flavors are the same. It is bad. So. That's what they use. They use uh, alginate in 
in dentistry. Um, have you ever watched like a surgery on TV where like they put something on before they cut they cut open and it turns it all yellow? Yeah, that's iodine. Okay, um, it is an, a disinfectant. Okay, and we actually extract iodine from kelp as well. Okay, um, we use it also in cattle feed. So hold on, guys. We use it in cattle feed. Um, so we'll put like kelp in cattle feed to help with protein levels and stuff like that. And it's also um, used to make potash. So if you throw some, some kelp and some water in a pot and you boil it and you boil all the water away, you'll have like a white residue left called potash. It's actually an, a nitrogen compound that's a, an explosive. Okay. So yeah. Um, and it's also used in fertilizer because nitrogen is good in fertilizer. Hmm? It, yeah. No, it's the kelp. It's the kelp in the water. And you boil it. And you boil all the water away and you have like... <laughs> Why do you want to know? <laughs> so all of this is great. We can extract all of these things. But what's really great is that um, it's actually very sustainable to get all of this stuff. Because um, macrocystis giant kelp can actually grow two feet a day. So if you go out and you like harvest the top uh, two feet of the kelp forest, the next day you go back and it's grown back. So yeah, you can harvest, harvest it often, which is great. Two feet a day, that's crazy. That's a lot to grow. Okay, hold on. And here's pictures of brown algae. 